to the Urology Grand Rounds, uh, where we're going to have Dr. Caitlin Johnson, who's going to discuss biomarkers in prostate cancer. And then we're going to have Dr. Daniel Siegel talk about treatment strategies for locally advanced prostate cancer, current and future. Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Johnson. I'm going to be presenting on biomarkers in the detection of prostate cancer, who to biopsy, and when to rebiopsy. Um, it's a big topic, got a lot to cover, so I'll try to move um, relatively quickly so we leave enough time for Danny. Uh, I have no disclosures. My objectives today are to discuss the controversy surrounding PSA screening, for everyone to become familiar with the FDA approved and commercially available markers that guide decisions regarding when to biopsy and when to rebiopsy, to understand, this, understand the strengths and weaknesses of, of the available biomarkers and know how they're applied in the guidelines. So first we have to talk about PSA. Um, it's also known as human calocrine 3. It's produced by prostatic luminal epithelial cells and found in prostatic secretions, and it serves to regulate semen coagulation. It's thought that elevated serum PSA levels are more of the result of disruption of the cellular architecture versus cancer cells just making more PSA. Um, and the diagram on the right shows how it's produced and eventually circulates into the bloodstream. Um, starts out as a zymogen pro-PSA, that's cleaved into pro-PSA, and then it's active form PSA, which again circulates in free and complex forms. Um, so PSA was discovered back in 1979. Uh, it became FDA approved in 1994 to aid in the early detection of prostate cancer with a cutoff of four. Um, and I think this is a great um, graphic that illustrates how uh, men presenting with metastatic prostate cancer dropped dramatically through the 90s, and this is presumably because of the use of PSA. PSA. Um, so it's allowed for earlier detection of the disease. Um, but the benefits of PSA have definitely been called into question in other ways. Um, here um, are two landmark studies in regards to PSA screening um, that called into the question of, you know, the, the, the benefit of PSA and its reduction in mortality. So the PLCO essentially said that there was no benefit to screening. So the people in um, the um, control arm um, had the same mortality as those that were in the um, screened arm. But this was heavily criticized, um, mostly due to its contamination. So a lot of men who were in the control arm underwent PSA screening before the uh, randomization and during the study itself. So really it's not a true test of screening versus no screening, but more like a, you know, um, a study of screening annually versus ad hoc screening. Um, there was also the ERSPC, um, which um, did demonstrate some benefit um, to PSA screening, um, but came at a high cost. So the number needed to screen um, in the initial rendition of the study was um, over 1,400, and the number needed to treat was 48 uh, in order to save one life. Um, and it was eventually shown that, you know, as the, the longer you followed this, that there was a reduction in these numbers to um, number needed, the terms change as well. The number needed to invite was 570 and the number needed to diagnose was 18 in order to save one life. Um, but, you know, I think both these studies still put a bad grade on PSA. Um, and the root of this, you know, controversy still exists. The fact that PSA is highly organ specific, but not cancer specific. So there's a lot of overlap between um, people with prostate cancer and people with benign disease, such as prostatitis, um, BPH, and um, even um, prostate manipulation can elevate PSA. Uh, and we know that there's a lot of unnecessary prostate biopsies, upwards of 75%. Um, and there's morbidity associated with just the prostate biopsy alone, but also the downstream effects of overdiagnosis and overtreatment of the benign and indolent disease. Um, and what's also troublesome is that a significant proportion of men still harbor prostate cancer despite a normal PSA. So there's certainly a need to improve risk stratification, and uh, this has led to research to find um, new non-invasive biomarkers. Um, so the biomarkers I will be discussing today will help answer two of the questions that we kind of ask ourselves in the um, uh, di prostate cancer diagnostic pathway, namely when to biopsy and when to rebiopsy. Um, and I just wanted to kind of put verbatim what the, guide, the NCCN guidelines and AUA guidelines say about um, biomarkers currently. Um, and Essentially, they say they're out there and they can be used to inform prostate biopsy decisions, um, 
but beyond that, there's um, there it's 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 kind of dealer's choice if you want to use them or not. So here are the biomarkers I am going to be discussing today. There's blood-based, urine-based, tissue-based. Um, for the sake of time, I had to kind of uh, cut out PSA derivatives, but I think we're um, kind of well versed in things like PSA density, PSA velocity. Um, but I'll touch on one of those in just a moment. So first off, we have prostate health index. Um, so uh, other, otherwise known as PI. Um, PI aims to increase the diagnostic value of PSA by combining um, PSA, free PSA, and pro-PSA. Um, so pro-PSA is an isoform of PSA that is preferentially expressed in malignant cells and percent free PSA has been shown to be more um, sensitive and specific than PSA alone um, because cancer cells, uh, if you recall from the earlier slide about how PSA is produced, cancer cells can kind of escape the proteolytic processing. Um, so they tend to, people with prostate cancer tend to have more complex PSA in the blood, so a lower free PSA. So conceptually, this formula makes sense. A higher pro PSA, at any given PSA value, a higher pro PSA, a lower free PSA increases your PI score, um, which is associated with an increased risk. So this is kind of what is spit out um, for their report. They get all the data points and then they, um, they come up with a PI score that um, is essentially categorized into four risk buckets. So I think this is helpful in that um, you have a patient who has a um, PSA and kind of in that diagnostic gray zone, let's say it's a little over four, um, but they have a low PI score, you might consider just following them a little more closely versus someone who has a higher range, you know, 30, 40, 50, um, that might push one to biopsy right away. So this has been FDA approved since 2012 for PSA values between four and 10, and it's used in both initial and repeat biopsies, and it costs around um, $80. It's been shown to be more sensitive and specific for predicting prostate cancer than I don't either total PSA or percent free PSA. Um, for the receiver operating characteristics um, analysis, the area under the curves for a pi tends to be more in the 0.7 to 0.8 range, whereas if you look at total PSA, it's more like 0.55. Um, and this has been validated among international studies, prospective studies, grassroots screening programs. Uh, it's also shown to improve cancer detection in cases with Gleason scores greater than seven or seven or greater. Um, and it's been shown that with using a cutoff of 25 to biopsy could avoid 40% of unnecessary biopsies and reduce 25% of um, Gleason grade six uh, diagnoses at the cost of missing just 5% of clinically significant cancers, usually seven or greater. Um, and PI has also been added to risk calculators to improve the accuracy of those risk stratifications. Next up, we have for the 4K score. Um, this incorporates free PSA, total PSA, human calocrine 2, and intact PSA, along with other risk factors such as age, DRE results, and prior biopsy history, um, and incorporates all this into algorithm and then spits out a risk. So it's conceptually similar to PI, but it also includes these other risk factors. Um, it's commercially available, but not FDA approved. It's recommended for initial and repeat biopsies, and it costs around $500 in the U.S. Um, so Vickers and colleagues first uh, demonstrated in 2010 in a cohort of uh, a little over 2,900 men with an elevated PSA undergoing um, prostate biopsy for the first time that um, uh, when they compared their 4K score to their biopsy outcome, um, 4K had better predictive accuracy than PSA alone. So they concluded that you could avoid, avoid um, over 50% of unnecessary biopsy, you know, over 500 biopsies, um, missing just uh, 54 of 177 low-grade cancers and missing 12 of 100 high-grade cancer. It's also been shown to predict the risk of um, Gleason grade 2 or higher cancer on prostate biopsy and um, the long-term risk of prostate cancer metastasis. But the issue with this test is that there hasn't been an established uh, threshold to biopsy, or there's been, you know, controversy over, like, what that established threshold should be to biopsy. In the comparative study, in a Compared to study of uh, PI and 4K, um, among 531 Swedish men undergoing biopsy for the first time, um, PI and um, 4K score were similar in their discriminative abilities. 
um, to predict all prostate cancer and um, high, high grade prostate cancer. So I think both of these are simple blood tests that can be used, um, certainly have shown better um, sensitivity and specificity than PSA for all cancer, um, higher grade prostate cancers, um, as well as um, potentially reducing the number of um, biopsies. So moving along now into the urinary-based biomarkers, we have prostate cancer antigen 3, PCA3. It's a non-coding RNA um, that is determined from a post-DRE urine specimen. So here's a little diagram, shows what to do. You do three strokes per lobe when you're doing your prostate exam. Uh, it's a first catch urine specimen and that is then sent off. Um, and why this is important is it's, you know, it's non-PSA based. Um, so it's, it's uh, PSA3 has been shown to be elevated in over 90% of prostate cancer tissues, um, but not in normal or BPH tissues. So um, it's not correlated with prostate volume or serum PSA. This has also been FDA approved since 2012 to specifically aid in the decision for um, repeat biopsies. So someone who was biopsied previously um, because of whatever threshold they met, you know, a, a elevated PSA and, um, and that biopsy came back negative. So now you're deciding whether to biopsy them again or not. Um, and that test costs around $300. Um, this uh, was validated among 859 men from 11 centers who underwent, underwent prostate biopsy. Their primary outcome was to determine the positive predictive value um, for initial biopsy and negative predictive value for repeat biopsy um, using a threshold of 20 for the, their PCA3 score. Um, so based on this data, um, they said that 3% of men with a low PCA3 score would have high grade prostate cancer that would be missed. In contrast, this is seen here on the bottom diagram. So over here, 3% um, would have a high grade prostate cancer that would be missed um, using this versus 13% um, of high grade cancers that would be missed if it, it was for an initial biopsy. So the, the sensitivity on initial biopsy has definitely been variable. Um, and its ability to predict features of locally advanced prostate cancer is conflicting. So that's why it's not appropriate in the initial biopsy setting. PI is also shown to outperform PCA3 in its prediction of clinically significant prostate cancer on biopsy. Um, so it should be, again, should be limited to men who um, have an elevated PSA with a negative biopsy. Um, commonly, 35 is a cutoff that's used, but that also remains controversial. Um, there have been a couple of tests that have tried to improve the accuracy of PCA3. Um, uh, MIPS is one of them, which incorporates PCA3 and then this other um, gene fusion panel. Um, TMPRSS2 is a um, antigen um, transcriptional promoter gene, and ERG is a, an oncogene that has been shown to be associated with prostate cancer. Um, so these, these tests might actually improve PCA3 alone, but um, the NCCN says specifically that these are um, considered investigational. Next, we have select MDX, which measures um, uh, mRNA levels of two genes, um, DLX1 and HOHCX genes in the post-DRE urine specimen. These genes have also been demonstrated to be associated with prostate cancer. Um, and again, uh, the mRNA levels are um, combined with other risk factors, including total PSA, age, history of prostate biopsy, and family history um, to give the patient a risk. Um, it is designed to improve the identification of men with clinically significant prostate cancer prior to biopsy. Um, it was validated in um, 905 men in two prospective clinical trials. Um, the area under the curve was 0.9 in a training set and 0.86 in a validation set. So very good. Um, and the authors concluded that this could result in a de decrease of 42% um, of total biopsies and the negative predictive value for grade group two or greater cancers was 98%. Um, for this test, the NCCN guidelines um, dictate that it, sh it, it could be useful in men who have never undergone biopsy before. And kind of the newest test we have to the market is this um, microRNA sentinel test. It's a urine-based assay of exosome containing small non-coding RNAs. Um, so exosomes are, um, shed by tumor cells. They're thought to be maybe a form of cellular intercommunication. Um, and this was granted breakthrough designation by the FDA, FDA in 2020, which through my understanding is still not something that's quite FDA approved. It needs more testing, but it's very promising. 
Um, so what this group did, um, this, was, this was published just actually last year in the um, Journal of Urology. Um, this is a group based out of Albany and uh, I believe downstate. Um, what they did is they, essentially, they essentially did um, microsome sequencing on, um, on a group of patients. So they took a group of patients and they ran an entire panel, um, which included over 6,000 micro RNAs. And they pulled out 50 to 150 or 250 of um, the micro and RNAs that looked for whatever they were looking for. So essentially they were able among, you know, using the post-CRE, um, sorry, using just urine specimens, it doesn't have to be post-CRE, they were able to um, develop several tests that were able to differentiate between cancer versus no cancer, uh, grade group one versus grade group two to five, and grade group one to two versus grade group three to five. Um, so this is very um, data-driven. Um, it doesn't make any assumption about what these microRNAs do. It was just really finding that there are significant differences between the two groups in these, you know, panel of microRNAs um, when they when they ran the panel. So um, if you're looking at the um, area under the curves, they're quite remarkable, 0.99 to detect cancer versus no cancer, and the other ones are very similar, 0 0.97, 0 0.98. Um, so I think this is a very exciting direction. Um, certainly needs more studies to validate it among um, independent cohorts and racially diverse groups. Um, but I'm, I, I think this is a, we're gonna be hearing a lot more about this in the future. Um, I decided to mention ExoDX here. Um, given that it's kind of similar and then it's also looking for exosome um, expression um, among three genes though. And it's been shown to discriminate grade group two or greater prostate cancer from grade group one at benign disease and initial biopsy. And that's been, been available since 2017. Um, the NCCN says that the ExoDX can be used for initial or repeat biopsies. Um, and then finally, among the tissue-based um, biomarkers, we have confirm MDX. And what confirm MDX does is it looks at uh, it detects meth methylation changes associated with the cancerization process um, in cells next to the, the cancer. So it, it basically is looking for the, um, the, the changes associated with the cancer. The, you know, it's looking for, it's basically the, the, the needle biopsy just didn't hit the cancer, but it's, it's able to detect the, the, um, the field effect around the cancer. And um, the um, results end up being, you, know, you get a, a risk, but then you also get information about the localization of the cancer. So you kind of know where to focus your efforts next time. And um, again, this field effect has been a strong independent risk factor for diagnosing cancer in a subsequent biopsy. Um, so uh, the confirmed MDX, it's, it's been commercially available, but not FDA approved. It's been validated in two blind and multi-center studies. So it um, shows negative, uh, excellent negative predictive value of 98 to 90%. And it's an option for men with an elevated PSA and a previously negative biopsy. Um, so this is kind of all a summary of uh, the biomarkers that I talked about. Um, there are certainly a lot, there's, there's controversy surrounding all these as well. Um, I think that this is a, it's a confusing topic for both patients and providers. Um, you know, there's a lot of competing tests in the same market and um, not clear about which one to use and when. But um, the other issue is that there's, it's, it's still, you know, prostate cancer is a spectrum of disease and it's not giving you a black or white answer of cancer versus no cancer. Um, so that might be a little um, upsetting to some patients when they want an answer of what to do. And the other issue is that it's not widely used. Um, and just because we have statistical significance, it doesn't translate into improved outcomes. So I think the fact, you know, we probably won't have another um, large scale um, kind of population level based study to assess these screening as, as, a, as a screening tool. But um, I, I do think that these biomarkers are kind of here to stay. So um, in sum, the biomarkers have allowed for discrimination more th uh, better than PSA between to determine prostate cancer versus benign disease, um, the detection of aggressive cancer, and um, the reduction of unnecessary biopsies. Um, I think it's kind of our duty as um, urologists to 
perhaps engage in these to, to help patients engage in more thoughtful shared decision making. And again, you know, biomarkers are definitely here. Um, we are going to be hearing a lot more about them. So I think it's important to know them and, and perhaps even be using some of them. But I would love to hear um, kind of what other providers are doing, how they kind of use them in their um, decision algorithm um, and treatment practices and any thoughts they have. So these are my references. Um, thank you for your time and I'm happy to take any questions or hear any comments. Thank you, Caitlin. That was a great overview. Um, I think one just sort of comment on, uh, so I, I agree with everything you put there. One thing to be careful with is the 4K test and um, Confirm MDX are not FDA approved, but they that is sort of a non sequitur for them because they are not laboratory based tests. They don't need FDA approval. They're, I guess, 510K approved. So they're commercially available, but not being FDA approved doesn't mean that they, they're not able to be FDA approved. So um, it's sort of a false negative for them. Okay. And Does that make no sense? So if, if people were worried about not using them because they didn't have FDA approval, if they cannot right. get FDA approved because of the nature of their of them being a test. So that's okay. not Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah. Hey, Kaylin. Okay, I think that was a great talk. I think that, um, you know, one thing that we're so fortunate here at our campuses is that we also have a great MRI program. Um, if you had a patient that had a PSA, persistently elevated PSA of five, 65 years old, healthy, and he was just really adamant against a biopsy. And let's say he had a pyrad two lesion. What is the one urinary test that you think that you could use that would help your decision? Patient who has an elevated PSA, um, pyrads two MRI. So you yep. could, doesn't want a biopsy, but says, if you show me any more evidence to convince me to get a biopsy, I'll do it. So what is one He's urinary test? a biopsy, Paisley. Correct. Um, well, you, so you wouldn't use PCA3. You could use, um, you could use select MDX. Um, I don't really know the best answer, but I was curious. <laughs> yes, yeah, select MDX or XODX. We, we have the XODX test available. Uh, it's been around for a few years and, and um, had better data. Select MDX is they're showing better data now. Their clinical validation studies have only come out sort of recently, um, whereas XODX is, is pretty easy to, to collect. I mean, the one difference between those is the XODX, a patient can come in, give a sample, and leave. It can be a nursing visit, whereas the select MDX, they need to, I believe, have a prostate massage still uh, to gather the to gather the um, sample. So there are some technical considerations, um, and that's one of the great things about the exosomes is that they're really easy because it, it's not an expressed RNA, so that no prostate uh, massage, gentle rub massage is, is necessary. Um, so that can potentially tip some people towards certain things. Preston, in that scenario that Casey just posed, if the patient wants reassurance that they don't have prostate cancer, why not do a PCA3, which is specific to prostate cancer, um, at the risk of missing a not or having a non-diagnostic, but it comes back. Yeah, so so you kind of cut up there a little bit, but so PCA3, you know, Positive, we, we could say you, you do need a biopsy. Right, you could. Yeah, so you could use a PCA3, but I think, I mean, again, a PCA, it depends on if you have a patient in your office, they want to have a, another prostate massage. If you want to do a prostate massage and then collect a urine specimen or just have them pee in a cup and you have the XODX study. Uh, which they can pee in a cup and they don't need to, and you don't need to do any of the extra work. Um, and it's, uh, and you get a similar result. So you could do a PCA3, but what you're doing there is you're kind of 
look very looking in a detailed way at the data um, because of sort of the lack of its sensitivity. Uh, you know, it's no longer indicated in the early, in the first biopsy setting. Um, I mean, I think so. You know, it's easy to get more tests in these situations and keep getting tests. The more tests you get doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have make any difference. I think just from an overall counseling perspective, Casey, the main thing is what is that patient's threshold? What risk are they willing to accept? Because, you know, adding another test, you're not going to get none of those urine tests are in any of the nomograms now. But someone with a PSA of five, a PIRADS2 lesion, never had a biopsy before, you can plug all of that stuff in a nomogram and tell them what their risk is. And it's and you're not going to get a test that says no or yes. What you're going to get is what is their risk threshold for having a biopsy? If their risk is 12%, are they willing to accept a 12% risk or not? Um, and so I think it's a, it's a larger discussion for many of those patients about what their risk tolerance is, not necessarily that eight, because no single test is going to prove anything. Thank you, Preston. You know, for the sake of time, I, I don't want to cut into uh, Dr. Siegel's presentation. Um, so let, let's uh, let Dr. Siegel present, and then we can always come back to more questions if there's time. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, today I'll be talking about treatment strategies for locally advanced prostate cancer, current and future directions. Uh, it was recently brought to my attention that perhaps my title is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, you know, uh, kind of grouping together some things like locally advanced, uh, nodal positive disease, maybe low volume metastatic disease, and I recognize that each of these may be enough to have an entire talk, but we'll kind of go through some data here. Um, we'll start with a quick case presentation. For example, we'll have a 65-year-old otherwise healthy male who has known history of Gleason 3 plus 3 prostate cancer. He was diagnosed two years ago, had a PSA of around 12, uh, no evidence of metastatic disease on initial imaging. He's been on active surveillance. Uh, you know, we've been, we've been trending his PSA, and uh, he's been due for a repeat MRI and biopsy. On his MRI, he had a new PIREDS4 lesion, uh, and the latest biopsy after that showed uh, two new cores of grade group 3 prostate cancer and some residual grade group 1 disease. So at this point, usually, we'd start considering a discussion with our patients about definitive treatment, but beforehand, uh, you know, you'd want to probably consider some staging imaging, especially if it hasn't been done in a long time. And so uh, that's what was done for this patient. And I'll jump into a CAT scan here. And his CAT scan was generally all right, but when we got down into the pelvis, you can see us one large um, right-sided pelvic wall lymph node, uh, and then another enlarged pelvic wall lymph node on the left side. Um, so his CT scan was read as two prominent lymph nodes each about one, a little bit larger than one centimeter. Uh, he also had a bone scan, which showed no evidence of skeletal metastatic disease. So this patient presents to us now with clinical T1C, N1, M0 prostate cancer. So we've got nodal disease, clinically nodal disease based on imaging. Um, he has no distant mets. And so what are our current evidence-based treatment, treatment guidelines for this patient with nodal disease? Um, Based on some, based on our guidelines, you know, you, you can actually offer this patient ADT, as we know, and you can add upfront radiotherapy. So to, to jump into where this all came from, we'll take a step back and review some studies. Um, this is a charted trial. This is a big randomized uh, perspective controlled trial that was published in 2018 in the journal of Clinical Oncology. And it basically looked into um, the treatment response of ADT with the addition of new novel therapies in order to prolong castrate time to prostate castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, the interesting finding from this study was that the addition of docetaxel to ADT was found to uh, prolong survival. Uh, the, the reason I bring this study up isn't so much so about adding docetaxel, it's not really what this talk is about, but they did a important subgroup analysis in this where they found the greatest effect um, of, in those with high volume disease. Uh, so as you can see here, they found that those who had high volume disease were actually the only ones with statistically significant uh, benefits adding docetaxel to their ADT. But like I said, the reason I'm kind of bringing this up and harping on it is because of the subgroup analysis that they did of high volume disease versus low volume disease. They defined high volume disease as uh, any visceral metastases 
and or uh, greater than or equal to four bone mets with one of them having to the outside of the vertebral column or pelvis. Low volume disease, easy to remember, would be anything that's not high volume disease. Um, so, you know, our patient, zero distal, no distal mets, he had no bone scan positive disease. Um, he does have nodal positive disease though, however. Um, jumping off of that, we go into another clinical trial, the Stampede trial, another large trial published in Lancet 2018, a uh, prospective randomized control trial, which was uh, done across 117 different institutions. There were over 2,000 patients that entered into randomization. And uh, in one arm of this large trial, they assessed the response of ADT alone versus now ADT with upfront uh, radiotherapy for those with hormone sensitive prostate cancer, metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And they hypothesized that those with low metastatic burden would have a better response to the addition of upfront radiotherapy. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, those low and high volume metastatic burdens, they used those charted criteria to uh, take a look at this data. And what they found was that uh, there was actually a pretty big um, benefit for those patients, but to, to adding radiotherapy, but only in the low metastatic burden. You know, they found a statistically significant benefit um, amongst those with low metastatic disease uh, when you added radiotherapy for overall survival, for failure-free survival, progression-free survival, prostate cancer-specific survival. Um, this was a. Uh, this is just. I like this graph just because it showed you know actual deaths per group, and there was a you know a large benefit in those only in the low burden uh, metastatic disease category when you added radiotherapy. Similarly, here are some nice Kaplan-Meier curves that look at overall survival on the top row and uh, failure-free survival in the bottom row, and they break it down in low metastatic burden versus high metastatic burden. And uh, you can see on the left, the only uh, statistically significant ones and the only difference between the controls, you know, ADT alone versus ADT plus radiotherapy, uh, you know, there was a difference in only the low metastatic disease. So the findings of this study ended up showing that, you know, adding radiotherapy to the prostate, this definitive radiotherapy treatment up front to the prostate did not improve overall survival for the unselected patient with newly diagnosed metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. However, the overall survival did improve for those with low metastatic burden. And that's kind of where this guideline comes from, that uh, you know, in selected patients with metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer and low volume metastatic disease, you may offer primary radiotherapy to the prostate in combination with ADT. And so, you know, that kind of gets us thinking is, is what about alternatives to radiotherapy? So if radiotherapy plus ADT is currently guideline recommended, what all their alternatives have been studied? We know that treatment of the primary tumor, our, our you know, standards are radiation and surgery. So what about cytoreductive surgery? Is that something that has been studied? What is the data behind it? Um, just to take a step back briefly, we know cytoreductive surgery from other other um, models, you know, we know very well from some controversial models with kidney cancer. Uh, there was a Carmina trial which showed up, you know, which looked at uh, upfront nephrectomy with TKI versus the TKI alone. And that trial actually, you know, controversial, but was, showed evidence against cytoreductive nephrectomy. And there's another trial, a third time trial, which showed, uh, which compared receiving a cytoreductive nephrectomy with a TKI versus pre treating with systemic therapy, then getting surgery, then having systemic therapy again. And this one, the, the reason I bring it up is because it brought up a, an important idea that, that there was a, a benefit for those who responded to upfront systemic therapy. So this kind of brings up the idea that we talk about a lot of responders versus non-responders, where perhaps surgery is better suited in these patients for those who respond initially, as opposed to you know, subjecting a patient to surgery after they haven't responded and, and that'll you know, have, have a poor prognosis. So what about cytoreductive prostatectomy or surgery, definitive surgery on the prostate? It's not a novel idea. It's been studied for years. This is um, a preclinical animal model, that animal model study that was published in the Journal of Urology nearly 40 years ago. Um, what they looked at in this study was um, this tumor variant, this prostate cancer tumor variant uh, that you know, invariably metastasized to the lung. 
they took the this tumor variant, they implanted it into rats, and they examined um, treatment with different regimens, either a single dose of chemotherapy, surgical excision of this primary tumor that they had implanted, or a combination of tumor excision with chemotherapy. And what was interesting about this is that they only the combination of tumor excision with chemotherapy substantially prolonged survival and even produced some cures. Now, that's great and all, but um, you know, that's an animal model and that's 40 years old. What about any data in humans? And uh, what about some stuff that's more recent? Uh, to kind of highlight that, I went, uh, I went in and looked at, this is a systematic review on cyto papers. I looked into cytoreductive prostatectomy um, published in 2018. It looked at available literature. It included seven different studies from large registries um, it included one case control study. And uh, the limitation to all these, before we get into some of them, is that um, you know, they're all retrospective in nature. They, um, four of the studies use the same database, a SEER database, so there's you know, the potential that we're just reanalyzing the same database and coming up with the same results. And then within each study, there are obvious flaws you know, inherent to retrospective studies. And you know, there are also some differences in the treatment groups, such as like age, comorbidities, extensive disease. This is um, a busy slide here, but it kind of goes over a little bit each of the studies. And just starting at the top, there was this study in 2014 that out of the SEER database um, that did show a statistically significant um, benefit in five-year overall survival for cytoreductive prostatectomy. Similarly, another SEER database study showed a statistically significant benefit for prostate cancer-specific mortality for the cytoreductive prostatectomy group. Um, equally, another SEER database study showed, uh, looked at three-year disease-specific survival with a benefit to cytoreductive prostatectomy. And another SEER database is kind of what I mentioned. You know, they're all kind of repeating the same, the same study almost, but another prostate cancer-specific mortality one. Then there were a couple of other ones outside of the SEER database that they kind of reproduced some of this data. The National Cancer Database uh, was analyzed in 2016 and equally showed a, a five-year overall survival benefit to those patients who received cytoreductive prostatectomy. Um, there's another data, the prostate cancer database and, and the Munich Cancer Registry, which equally showed that. And the last one was a case control series um, out of Germany, which um, was a feasibility case control study that assessed cytoreductive prostatectomy in patients with uh, prostate cancer and low volume metastatic disease. Um, so this was patients with biopsy proven prostate cancer and low volume MEX, which they described in this study um, as less than three skeletal metastases. Uh, all the patients in this study had been pre-treated with ADT and uh, they needed a PSA nadir of less than one prior to having gone, undergone any surgery. So essentially what they did in this study um, was they pre-selected for responders, you know, that, that concept that we talked about earlier. They had 23 patients in the treatment group, uh, 38 in the control, so small sample size. Like I said, it's a small case control study, but it, it did show a benefit, just barely, uh, p-value of 0.048, um, to the cytoreductive prostatectomy group as, as opposed to ADT alone for overall survival. And so lots of retrospective data, lots of database studies, uh, but still no level one evidence that is supporting the use of prostatectomy. And so what, what are we supposed to do with that? Well, there are active ongoing trials. Um, a big one that is currently undergoing is uh, the Southwest Oncology Group, the SWOG 1802 trial. It's a phase three randomized trial of standard systemic therapy versus uh, standard systemic therapy plus a definitive treatment, either surgery or radiation. So in arm one of the trial, um, you would receive induction treatment plus docetaxel and prednisone, and that can include, include anything like abiraterone, biclutamide, tegarolex, flutamide, gosterolin, histrolin, any of the things that you see there. Um, and then in the uh, treatment arm, you would have induction treatment plus a definitive therapy where the patients would be randomized to radical prostatectomy versus radiation therapy. Um, they excluded patients with brain mets in the study, and they also um, 
patients were not allowed to have progressed on standard systemic therapy. So again, that, that kind of brings in that same topic of responders and non-responders, which I think is a, an important thing to keep in the back of our heads. Um, where basically, if you're progressing after receiving standard systemic therapy, they're not going to you know, proceed with primary treatment because you, you want to automatically exclude these non-responders. A uh, study began pretty recently in 2018. It, they estimated it to complete in 2028. Um, and unfortunately, there's no data yet from this study that's about, accrued about 24%. And they are actually struggling a little bit to accrue patients into this trial. There are um, multiple other active clinical trials ongoing. Um, I mentioned SWOG 1802. There is this uh, surgery and metastatic carcinoma of the prostate, SIMCAP. There's another active ongoing trial looking at adjuvant treatments to the local tumor. Um, uh, other ones looking at, you know, adding radical prostatectomy to those with oligomets, um, radical prostatectomy with limited bone mets. Similarly, comparing prostate uh, surgery versus radiation for local metastatic disease. Um, you know, a lot of them basically all looking at the same thing, but with kind of different endpoints. Uh, each study is designed to assess different outcomes and they have different trial designs, um, you know, different outcomes that they're studying within metastatic populations, such as overall survival, uh, progression-free survival, the feasibility, which is important of randomizing between um, standard therapy, cytoreductive prostatectomy, radiation therapy, et cetera. Um, you know, they do the same thing looking in the oligometastatic setting, you know, time to crest castration resistance, overall, survive, overall survival, and again, feasibility to randomize patients. They also have looked at secondary endpoints such as cancer-specific outcomes, quality of life, uh, differing inclusion criteria based on volume of, you know, disease, whether they have nodal positive disease, oligomets, high volume disease, uh, how the disease is diagnosed, whether it's um, by biopsy confirmation metastasis or biopsy positive node disease, um, or it's just based on clinical imaging, what imaging modalities are used. So, you know, as we are advancing in our uh, imaging techniques, you know, we are also advancing in our ability to, to identify potential metastases. So something that may now light up on a, a PET CT or, or a PSMA, sorry, study, uh, may not have ever shown up on just a regular imaging study in years past and, and what to do about that. And, and some of these studies are actually looking at that. And then additionally, what the follow-up regimen should be for any of these patients. The, the problem has been in a lot of these studies is that there is trouble accruing patients. Um, you know, and I think one of the reasons for that is that guidelines are already kind of recommending one therapy, where, as I mentioned earlier, you know, radiation is already guideline approved and recommended upfront radiation for those with low volume metastatic disease. So the question is, is did radiation kind of beat surgery to the punch? It's hard to offer, I think it's hard to offer a new treatment and convince a patient to go into a clinical trial where one where one um, arm of the trial has been heavily studied and the other has not, even though there may be science behind it. And so this kind of leaves us with what uh, what will happen in the future, what, what are our strategies going to be look like moving forward, and it's hard to say because these studies haven't really come out yet and we're going to rely on them. Um, one thing we need to look at in these studies is the toxicities that need to be uh, compared. We know the traditional toxicities of radiation versus surgery and the morbidities associated with each, but you know, do these differ when the patient's also receiving systemic therapy? Um, and then you know, once these trials come out, we'll have a better idea, but, but it's looking more and more like a you know, conversation between patient and provider, and it, it might be a specific patient-based selection. Um, you know, will there be that classic split in the future like we have currently with surgery versus radiation, but now in a, you know, nodal positive or metastatic scenario? Um, you know, one thing that I keep thinking about having read through all these studies is, you know, if someone responds to systemic therapy early on, doesn't progress and has low volume disease, maybe they're a great candidate for surgery. You know, if they're a young patient, low volume disease, response to ADT, maybe surgery might be great, um, or maybe radiation, as we know, it 
can stay better for older, less functional patients. Um, but or you know, like I said, it's unstudied. So so are some of these differences not as important? You know, we know that radiation causes a lot more long-term effects. But perhaps if you're a metastatic patient, your uh, life expectancy is shorter, so the long-term effects of radiation aren't as applicable. All things that we need answers to. And so to jump into um, just the conclusions of, of where we stand, the current standard for low volume metastatic disease that we know is you know, either ADT alone or, or upfront radiotherapy with ADT. And there are multiple ongoing studies that are trying to compare radiation versus radical prostatectomy in the same setting. But as I mentioned, there's some difficulty accruing for these patients, uh, for these trials. Um, you know, perhaps it was you know, one, having one therapy recommended over the other might make it more difficult. And ultimately, it'd be difficult to make changes without definitive data, but I, I do believe that some of these trials will accrue and, and come up with some data points that will allow us to change the way that we you know, treat this type of disease moving forward. So to go back to our you know, case presentation, we have this otherwise healthy 65-year-old male who had grade group 1 prostate cancer that was upstaged to grade group 3 disease um, after biopsy with positive nodes on staging CT. So, you know, what, what would you offer this patient? Would you, you know, keep clinical T1, node, nodal positive disease, no distant mets? You know, do you just say, okay, let's give him ADT alone? You add ADT with upfront radiation. Um, perhaps you do a clinical trial. You add them to, into a clinical trial where they get randomized and they have a chance to have surgery where you do your lymphadenectomy and also have a chance to cure the patient completely of disease. Um, you know, it, it, I think it's interesting in a young patient like this who would otherwise do great with surgery. I think these clinical trials are a good way forward. So I'll open up to questions. Thanks, Danny. That was a great, uh, great overview. A very thoughtful sort of discussion about some of the limitations of these trials. Um, we had S1802, the SWOG study, open at Yale. Uh, it is currently at, with COVID. We are sort of have it on hold. I'm hoping that we can open it again. As you mentioned, there's a challenge with recruiting patients to the surgery arm. Um, the sort of more nuanced thing, though, is not necessarily that there, the radiation is clearly better than surgery. The issue is that if patients can be randomized to ADT alone, where in those low risk groups, if they select radiation, if they select the radiation and they, and they get randomized to ADT alone, we know that that's inferior to ADT plus radiation based on the stampede data. So the medical oncologists are hesitant to refer patients for the trial. Um, I think what you brought up though is maybe it would obviously skew the data some, but maybe we need to be looking at the high-risk patients, the patients with multiple metastases, uh, and because there isn't a clear benefit to radiation in those patients, maybe that's where we will need to recruit people for the surgery side. Although theoretically, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to have good outcomes from surgery either. So I don't want to set the trial up to fail. So it, it is a challenging situation right now, especially where most of those referrals would be coming from the medical oncologist because they are seeing the, the patients first. Um, so I, I agree that recruitment is, is, has been a challenge for that study. Okay, so it's um, it's 8.30. Uh, I think a lot of people would like to go to clinic into the operating room now. So I want to thank everyone for uh, coming to Grand Rounds and have a good weekend.